Hi there Pop-Tart, thank you so much for the amazingly positive and really interesting response to the last video that I made about chaos magic. Excuse the clickbaity title but I could not fucking help myself. There's so much that I want to cover when it comes to talking about magic and obviously I look at the theme of magic through the lens of chaos magic and I consider myself to be a practitioner of chaos magic theory. However, I just really do like to riff on the subject of magic and on the subject of making things happen using, you know, the manipulation of energy, your intent, your imagination. Um, and all that kind of good stuff and I love to talk about like magical models and how we can traverse the epic winding oceans of what's possible with magic I think it's really fun I do in a way consider magic to be self-transformative psychodrama so I do follow that psychological model but I also do believe that something is happening with energy and you know so there's a few different things that I believe and they kind of cross over I'm quite paradoxical in the way that I approach magic and the interesting thing about chaos magic is that it really entertains that paradoxical nature that human beings have. It doesn't encourage you to stay grounded in one thing and to choose one thing. It actually says that your contradictions, your paradoxes, the different ways that you look at things, um, that's actually a strength for you as a practitioner. You can use that and, and make that work for you. And that's what I love so much about chaos magic. Today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about servitors, what they are, how you can make them, what they're used for and that kind of thing. I know that a lot of people are really, really interested in learning more about this and I definitely can forgive them for that. It is a really juicy part of anybody's magical practice. It's incredible if you've never made a servitor or looked into this shit then you need to strap yourself in because stuff is about to get really fucking weird in the best possible way. I mean this is where all the fun stuff happens. This is this is just epic. Servitors are my jam 120% and I just make no apology for it. In the Western esoteric tradition, servitors are usually known of as thought forms, and that might be a phrase, a terminology that you've heard more than servitors. Servitor is a descriptor that usually you only really find in chaos magic circles. Um, but yeah, thought forms, servitors, same thing. And thought form really... Um, gives you a good idea of what a servitor is. It is a entity that you consciously create um, for the purpose of helping you with a task or fulfilling a certain task. Some people creating a servitor to fulfill a task of some kind is one of the key ways in which they do magic. And you do actually end up, if you get really into servitor creation, you kind of end up with a whole um, phone book, you know, of a, an astral workforce that you created over time. You know, you can just like bell up a servitor and, and get them to uh, get the job done for you. The creation of servitors or magical thought forms to achieve a certain aim or fulfill a certain task is not for everybody. I'm just going to give you um, an idea of, of how it's done so that you can decide whether or not you want to go into it. Indeed, if you have already been uh, playing around with servitor creation, some of the tips that I offer in this video might help you out or might help you to make your own practice of servitor creation and charging and the use of servitors just a little bit more profound and a little bit more effective, hopefully. You might not actually be here for any information about servitor creation whatsoever to be fair you might just be a very concerned fundamentalist christian who's here to see how the other half live and if that's you then take a seat and learn how to make a servitor i guarantee you it will be bags of fun why hate when you could imitate in Phil Hines' book, Condensed Chaos, he actually suggests that the first part of creating a servitor, the first step, if you like, in the creation of a servitor, should be to specify the intention for the servitor, like what is it for, what is it going to do? And he suggests that you break down the definition of the intention into general, first of all, and then specific. And I think this is a really good idea. For example, a general use for a servitor that you were going to create could be healing and the specific use for this servitor that is concerned with healing could be to help you to deal with an ailment that you have been struggling with for weeks or months. So first of all you're looking to like categorise the nature of the servitor. What is this servitor all about? What kind of realm does it fall into? And then get specific about what exactly you want the servitor to do. What is its task? One really good thing to do to make your servitor creation process really creative and fun is to take a look at the general um, theme that the servitor corresponds with, like healing, protection, empowerment, battle, or any other number of things. Um, take a look at the 
theme that the Cerbatal corresponds with and then think about all of the associations that you personally make with that theme. So for example, let's stick with healing. If you know that the general theme or the general energy of this Cerbatal is going to be the theme of healing, then start by thinking about all the different things that you associate with healing um, and start to write them down, you know, start to hash it out in your mind. So for me, when I think of healing, I think of um, white light, I think of rose quartz, I think of drum circles, I think of um, alternative forms of healing like shamanic modalities and stuff I also think of nurses and doctors I think of bandages I think of medicines you know so there's all these different associations that I've personally got with healing and some of them will be associations from my own life and what I've been through and some of them will just be wider cultural associations that we all really know and have in mind when we think of the term healing this kind of sets the foundation and from there you go on to think about the very specific task that you want the servitor to kind of respond to and adhere to Start to think about the goal that you want to give to your entity or the goals, plural, if that's the case, and also the kind of results that you want to see and how you want the servitor to go about obtaining those results. Now, the next few things that I'm going to suggest for your servitor creation process could go in any number of different orders and you can forego some of them. It really does depend on your individual response to the servitor creation process, your core personality and how things gel with you. Um, for me personally, I like to think about a few different things before I go ahead and create a symbol and program the symbol and actually get my servitor alive and up and running and existing somewhere in the astral or in the ether helping me with my shizzle. Choosing a name. Choosing a name for your servitor or thought form can be a really fun part of the creation process. It can also help you to narrow down how you want to feel about the servitor and how you want the servitor to respond to the task that you've set for it. Um, for some people, choosing a name will come uh, way later in the creation process and for others it will be the very first thing. I like to start playing around with names and for me, I like a combination between uh, comedy names, like funny names, and also I like to go through the baby name book. I hate I hate the fact that it's called a baby name book because actually when you name a baby it's not just a baby name it's a name for life so baby names really pisses me off uh, but a book of names anyway and I like to look at the meanings of those names and see if I can find something that fits or google you know names that mean healing or names that mean empowerment and then see if I can figure something out there and sometimes I mix things together sometimes I choose characters from novels or names of songs anything like that that kind of taps me into what I'm trying to create with the servitor thinking about the naming process for a servitor very quickly leads the average person into thinking about the servitor's appearance which is another key part of servitor creation when you create a thought form you need to be able to bring your imagination to it you need to be able to really vividly see it you need that visceral picture of what it looks like now it may very well be a shape-shifting servitor and it may take on several different forms and I think that's absolutely cool and you can play with that idea but I think you know as you start to think of a decent name for the servitor and you've kind of clarified its intention or the goal that it has then and very quickly after that you start to think about appearance and that starts to come into the equation. Next up is where things get a little bit more technical because now we're going to start thinking about the servitor's basic needs. If you bring a thought form into being on the astral or in the ether or however you personally see it depending on your system of belief okay if you bring a thought form to life in that way then it stands to reason that one thing that would definitely strengthen the action of creating this servitor is to believe fully that the servitor needs to feed on something to exist and that the servitor actually lives somewhere and that is where the servitor is housed and the servitor also responds to certain commands rather like a well-trained pet would do these kinds of things all give life and animation and credence to the thought form that you want to create. So this to me is probably the most exciting or one of the most exciting phases of the thought form creation process and that is figuring out what it's going to feed on, how often it needs to feed and whereabouts it's going to live as well as how you're going to interact with it or summon it or give it commands. Let's stick with the um, basic needs of the servitor first of all. So um, you can very well choose to create a servitor that does not necessarily need anything to live per se um, but I often choose not to do that when I'm working with a servitor and when I bring that servitor into being to work with it for a length of time I want to get to know it and I want to interact with it and I want to feel like I'm responsible for it and like I'm regularly interfacing with it and a great way of doing that is to decide how I'm going to feed my servitor how I'm going to activate and sustain my servitor so 
So that's a lot more than just deciding upon a set word or a set, you know, um, mudra or a set of actions and words that bring the servitor to my beck and call. It's also about working out how I'm going to feed the servitor, how I'm going to nourish the servitor, and I keep checking in that way. You can choose any number of ways that your servitor is to be fed. You can choose to give the servitor offerings of a particular thing that it enjoys. You can choose to burn a particular kind of incense for the servitor and um, allow the servitor to feed off of that. You can decide that every time you walk alongside a certain river or in a certain woodland that actually activates and feeds and nurtures the servitor. You can select a particular song or a particular band or a particular album that every time you play it the servitor is nurtured and revived and regenerated by that. That is the servitor's food that it requires in order to exist and keep working on your behalf. Deciding where the servitor lives is also really cool because you can decide that the servitor actually lives somewhere in your actual physical environment. So you can go straight for materiality. You can decide, for example, that the servitor lives at the back of the wardrobe um, or the servitor lives in a particular drawer. The servitor lives at the back of your altar or maybe in a tiny spirit bottle or something like that. But you can also choose an astral marker and that can be the house where your servitor actually lives or where your servitor uh, is actually kind of instated if you like. I really enjoy working on the astral. I have an entire fucking landscape set up on the astral. I have markers, I have jumping points, I have places that I go for specific things and I have several astral altars that I work on too. Um, I have one in particular that has been my astral altar for a great number of years and I very often, if I'm going to be working closely with a thought form for any length of time, like to house the servitor or somewhere around there and I tend to actually build the servitor its own house um, on the astral and kind of leave the servitor instated there but just make sure that I do something on the physical in the material to actually feed the servitor although I really do think that when you're designing a servitor you can also very well just choose to um, you know, allow the servitor to be fed on the astral. So you can say, for example, this is just like right out of the box, you can say that your servitor is fed on astral bats and that um, astral bats are released, you know, in this certain part of the astral every second Wednesday and you henceforth free your servitor to fly off and feast on those bats or whatever the case may be. Um, you don't have to get into the very um, much more kind of high maintenance terrain of feeding the servitor um, using a ceremony or a ritual or something that you need to action. You don't have to do that, but I would personally suggest that it creates a stronger thought form experience if you actually have to feed the servitor in some way or do something to serve the servitor's life force. And it really can be as simple as just doing a chant that you are have connected to that servitor that feeds that servitor or lighting a candle or anything like that can be the way that the servitor is fed um, but the point is that you're going to program that information into the thought form so that when the thought form springs into life it knows that that's where it gets its food from you know that that is how you activate and regenerate the servitor so all of that stuff is going to be programmed in so it's important to think about it before you actually get started with um, firing the servitor up and kind of letting it loose and, and making it into the real deal. Next up you're going to think about what the servitor's abilities and strengths are. So how is the servitor going to help you do what it's going to be programmed to help you do? What are its superpowers if you like? How is it going to go about completing the task that you've set up for it? You can also choose things like personality traits, um, key characteristics and ways in which the servitor would interact with you. As you can see this is an intensely creative form of magic which really asks you to stretch your imagination and really use it and expand it and deepen into it so much and that's why I love it because I really feel that the central tool that I use in my magic is the imagination and the power of the imagination and I love to stretch that and play with it and see where it can ultimately go so that's really exciting for me. Something that can be overlooked when you are kind of designing a servitor is lifespan but this is actually really important right so it's, it's so easy to overlook it and yet it's such an important part of the creation process. Um, have a think about how long you want and need your servitor to actually exist for. 
for me, I personally don't necessarily enjoy lifespan as a term because I don't like the thought of putting so much of my power and my creative potency into something that I normally love and normally form an attachment to, only then to have it die, you know what I mean? I don't like the thought of it dropping down dead. So for me, I have two different ways in which I determine how long I'm going to work with a servitor for and how long I'm going to need to feed that servitor for. And the two kind of ways that I see it are on standby rather Rather like you would leave your machine on standby, your laptop or your TV, and then in retirement. And that is when I officially retire the servitor and they get to go and live, you know, on some area of the astral that I have created for them that is like their wondrous retirement home where all of their needs are seen to, but I don't actually have to have any interaction with them henceforth. I have a few servitors that I keep on standby, so basically I have an activation code for them, I have a way that I summon them into being, and then when I summon them into being they are very much there at my right hand and they are there to perform the task that they're there to perform. And when you power up a servitor that you've created like that to be on standby and to be at your beck and call when you need a specific thing doing, then the relationship that you build over time with that magical thought form is really potent, it is really fucking, it's popping, it's amazing. Um, so that's definitely a really cool thing to do. And for other servitors, for experiments that I've done in the past with magical thought forms, I have known that I would only need them for a short time span. I have known that it's not going to be a particularly long relationship. And so I have basically just um, decided on a rough date at which I will stop actively feeding them and actively engaging with them so that they can go into retirement. I could call on them again at another point, but I think with those more kind of short-term servitors that you use just for a little bit of backup, just for a little bit of magical aid as it were, I really don't feel that you are usually called to work with them again afterwards, you know? They kind of fade gracefully into the background and you don't generally want to pick them up again. I have once or twice picked them up again and worked with them again, but most of the time if I already know during the creation process that it's going to be a short-term dealio, then it's kind of like, you know, I affectionately think of them rather like I affectionately think of like certain people that I've had casual flings with but I don't necessarily want to bell them up and go to dinner like a year down the line you know what I mean so that's why I have that in retirement category which which is what works for me there's a generally accepted way to activate a thought form and actually bring it into being and kind of like switch it on you know so it's like there's a generally accepted way to to switch on that tamagotchi and say hey the tamagotchi is live now it's here it's i'm gonna feed it some sushi and you know all the rest of it um so if we're thinking about servitors like tamagotchis which apparently i am then there is a kind of accepted method of bringing one to life making it hatch and actually forging the relationship and getting things going and that is through the creation and activation of a sigil or symbol of some kind. A sigil is really just a magical symbol, that's all it is really. Um, it's just basically a symbol that is activated in some way with your intention or with a specific meaning and the fact that it is a symbol, the fact that it is a suggestion of something else but it's actually shrouded in a certain amount of secrecy and a certain amount of knowledge that only you as the magician have makes it very potent, it makes it much more potent than simply writing out the intention or drawing a picture of what you want to bring into being. Creating a sigil, creating a magical symbol of some kind, gives it that je ne sais quoi, yeah? It gives it that mystery and that intrigue and that sense that, um, as Odin said, what you and you alone know is always the most potent. That is such a a hardcore, fantabulous line from Norse mythology. What you and you alone know is always the most potent. And that's one reason why sigils are just so banging. They've, they've got such a, a pure fire of an energy to them, right? Because it's not something that you just lay out on the table for all to see. It's not something that if time froze right now, somebody could come in and look at your altar and see exactly what you were doing. A sigil makes it into a coded language that is just for you and your strong sense of intention. And that's one of the key reasons why it has such potency and why it stood the test of the time through, uh, through magic in the aeons in both the Eastern and Western traditions and, and all over the place. We're playing with symbols, we're fascinated fascinated by signs. We're really into sigils because it does have that sense of mystery and intrigue and when you create something that looks like it could be a stamp, it looks like an insignia, it looks like it really means something, then I feel like many many archetypes are poured into it and it starts to do something to you. It does something to your psychology, you know. It's really got a certain power to it. So that's why we use um, sigils or symbols of some kind to represent the servitor and to activate then the sigil and bring 
bring the Cerbitol to life as a result. There are a few different ways that are tried and tested that are definitely recommended for the creation of sigils. I'm going to talk about them in a video um, in a few days time or a week's time depending on when I put this one out. Um, but really for now all I will say is that I do feel that certain methods for creating sigils are very rigid and they're very dusty now, they're very old hat. For me personally I like to go way off the fucking deep end with my sigil creation. I like to use collage, I like to use all kinds of different things of that nature. I like to use sound, I like to create audio sigils and stuff like that. I'm really not into this whole write down your intention and then knock out every repeating consonant and make something out of that. Like I'm not really down for that. However I will teach that in the sigil video just so you have an awareness of one of the most popular ways to create a sigil. But I will also leave a link or two below so that you can um, learn how to create a sigil in the standard way. One of them will be the much loved Grant Morrison talk about sigil sigil magic which I definitely think is recommended viewing for you. If you've gotten this far into my video then you need to watch that Grant Morrison video. Do yourself a favour, pause me right now, don't even bother to finish me, just go and hang out with Grant because he's definitely, he's definitely got the sigil thing covered and he explains in that video in a very entertaining way, in a very impassioned way, how to make a sigil using the um, every repeating consonant write down your desire kind of technique. Now for me I'm not a fan of that technique, it does nothing for me quite honestly. I like to use, like I said, audio sigils, um, visual sigils, I like to take it as far as I can take it. There's a few other techniques that I will or will not get into depending on how much I want to uh, let you guys into my own life as a witch, because um, I can be a little cagey about some of my techniques. Um, but yeah, I, I really feel like the creation of a sigil is just the creation of a magical symbol that aligns with what you want to create, that symbolises the servitor that you want to bring into being. Then you are going to do something to activate it and that will be specific to your own system of belief okay uh, people do many different kinds of things to activate a sigil to actually put their intent into it and then to do something to make whatever is invested in that sigil come into being and I really encourage you to go as out of the box with this as you possibly can and do something that aligns with your personality and with what you really think is interesting. When some people make sigils they use very um, kind of common esoteric symbols so they might choose to use runes for example or they might use um, alchemical symbols. I have definitely used both of them in my sigil creation. I actually really like to use runes in the creation of sigils I select the runes that represent most closely the servitor that I'm going to be creating but then I also choose some other symbols and I use some symbols of my own devising. I might get the paints out and use some colour to represent even further what the servitor is being brought into being to do for me. One thing I would say about creating the sigil which is going to serve to fire up and actually ignite your servitor into life is that creating that sigil will not necessarily be a sit down and do it in five minutes kind of job. Um, you might be the kind of person that can very quickly and easily just create a sigil which you know definitely speaks to what you want your servitor to do and then just go ahead and fire that up in whatever way you choose uh, but for a lot of people myself included the creation of the sigil is itself quite an arduous process at times I need to feel connected to the sigil and I need to feel that it really represents what I've decided my servitor is going to do the personality my servitor is going to have you know the intentions for it what it looks like and everything else so sometimes I need to sit down and I, I need to play around with things, I need to do a little bit of artistic brainstorming, sometimes I might ask spirit um, or ask my matron or ask other guides what they think and give them just a little bit of input, you know, have a little bit of a board meeting with them. Um, it would be funny if I had a servitor to help me to design sigils for other servitors, wouldn't it? Mm, how meta, I should, definitely, uh, I should definitely try that one. So yeah, don't worry if you can't immediately get the hang of what you want your sigil to be, enjoy the creation process, really get right with it and then when you have the sigil I think it's really personally I think it's about creating your own system for firing it up. Um, some people will go into a trance state through chanting or through deep meditation as they gaze upon the sigil and they will actually move into the sigil and they will become one with the sigil until they don't know where the sigil ends and where they begin and then at the very at the point of the most potency and the most um, you know the, the most heightened trance state that you can think of 
of um, they will just release the sigil into the air or they will burn it in the fire or something of that nature um, some people love to burn a sigil to activate it some people love to masturbate over a sigil to activate it totally up to you whatever floats your boat whatever flicks your switch um, I really feel like the magical spectrum is just so much bigger than I could ever give credence to in one video so this is about how you think it would be the most potent to activate your sigil what do you think is going to work for you that's the question um, and I really think that that's an important thing one thing I want to say before I finish up today's talk about servitors is um, that before you activate your sigil and actually fire it up and bring your servitor into being make sure that you have an awareness of how you are going to summon your servitor it might be that you want to design a servitor that is always with you and is always at your right hand until such a time as you don't need them to be anymore and that's absolutely fine no problem however it might be that you intend the servitor to only be for specific kinds of situation and for that you're going to need an activation code be it a word be it a gesture be it a little dance that you do something like that that actually brings the servitor into being again this is about just being as creative as you can be and really taking it as far as you can and that's the joy I really think with servitors for me one of my key things that I love to do when it comes to magical thought forms is creating images of them I love to create an image of the thought form and while I'm activating the sigil and working on bringing the thought form into being I actually have the image of the thought form on my altar so I can really connect with what I want it to look like and I do this using paints and collage primarily although you might have your own way of doing it and for me that just really helps me to feel like the thought form is coming to life and I've really given it its appearance and I've given it its identity and then I keep every image that I've ever made of those thought forms because quite often with sigil activation I will burn the sigil so I will never again really see the sigil because I'm quite a fan of burning in order to activate and so I've got that that image that I've made of the sigil's appearance and I always have that you know so that's always with me and I can always look back through I suppose you could call it one's book of servitors or whatever um, but really I just normally tend to stick them into my book of mirrors or whatever and it's nice to have that there you know it's nice to have a, a memory a record if you like of all those wonderful faces and personalities that I have invented that I have birthed that I have mothered over time and to think about the reasons why I brought them into being and the fun that I had working with them and experimenting with magic in new and wonderful ways. I hope this has been useful for you. If you want more information on the creation of servitors, then there's definitely one book at least that I would recommend, and that is A Complete Guide to Entity Creation, Creating Magical Entities by David Michael Cunningham, um, with contributions by Taylor Elwood and Amanda Wagner. Um, this is it, this is the book, and I will link the title and authors underneath as well for your convenience. I definitely would recommend this as a way to just have a little one-stop shop for learning more about the creation of magical thought forms it's just a really useful book um, I do also want to mention that Phil Hine does have a really good introduction to servitors in his introduction to chaos magic called condensed chaos I would also definitely recommend that I hope this has been useful for you and that you've gotten something from it and let me know in the comments if you have already been fucking around with the concept of magical thought forms with or without knowing it and what kind of success you've had and whether or not you enjoy the process and very much love, blessed be.